Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website in enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's really my pleasure to interview Harry Dent on the show. He is a fantastic author and prognosticator that I have been following for must be almost 15 years now. And Harry Dent has really been sort of a god of the financial services industry. I mean, he, years ago, back in early 2000s, people were listening to his predictions with bated breath. I mean, he was the guru of Wall Street. And he's written several best-selling books. I discovered him, I believe the first book of his I read was The Great Boom Ahead, and I think that was published around 1995 or so. And then I read The Roaring 2000s and The Roaring 2000s Investor. I believe his last book was The Great Boom Bubble. And his next book, aptly enough, is entitled The Great Depression Ahead. So, you know, again, I want to just stress to all of our listeners, there's a lot of negative news out there. And you know what? I mostly agree with it. I think our economy is in a mess, a huge mess. But, you know, every crisis is an opportunity and there are loads of opportunities out there right now okay one more comment about harry dent i was really glad to interview him love his work he made some predictions many of which came true i mean the guy has just an impressive track record one that didn't come true and i did ask him about this was when he predicted that the dow would come to thirty thousand and of course that didn't even get anywhere close but he explains that in the interview and I think you'll really enjoy the interview. Again, Mr. Dent, just like so many commentators, uh, really virtually all of them, tends to view housing as a national market. And it's funny, you know, when you ask all of these experts about the real estate market or the housing market, they paint it with a broad brush. But as soon as you then ask them, well, what about Texas versus California or North Carolina versus California or North Carolina versus Florida, they say, oh, well, of course, you know, those are much better markets. So you have to kind of dig a little deeper when talking to all of these experts to really see what they think, because if you take it at face value, and I know that when they do their various media interviews and so forth and comment on the markets, they have to talk in sound bites and say things in brief format because television, for example, I think is largely the idiot's medium. You just don't have much time. So that's one of the things to just remember when you're listening. And as soon as I asked Harry Dent about the local markets, he parsed them up and segmented them. Anyway, I think you'll find this interview interesting. Again, not much time to talk to you today, but I will talk to you more on the next show. Listen in and enjoy the interview. Well, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome Harry Dent to the show. Harry, it's good to have you on. Nice to be here, Jason. Good. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do. You've written several books, many of them hot-selling books, and give us a little background on your company. Well, you know, I, I really got into forecasting in the late 80s after working in business consulting, first at Bain & Company with large companies and then with new ventures and small companies in California. And I just, you know, started realizing that the baby boom, this new generation, was driving all these trends and just kept doing more research and into the new technologies emerging and this generation and, you know, kind of came up with a, a whole new uh, way of approaching economics. We look at demographic cycles. In other words, the predictable things people do as they age. And, of course, people kind of come in large generational surges like the baby boom generation. And so... As the baby boom's been aging and, you know, getting married and having families and buying houses, we've seen a boom. And, and uh, we started realizing in the late 80s uh, when we first got some of our key indicators that, you know, a lot of people were calling for a depression in the 1990s on a famous, you know, Condratia for 
kind of 55, 60 year cycle. And we were saying, no, no, the 90s is going to see the greatest boom in history because the baby boomers are going to be in their strongest period of productivity and spending. And then that boom was going to continue into this decade. And we would uh, see a depression uh, of an extended downturn from late in this decade uh, into the next decade and beyond. We also predicted the Japanese slowdown in the early 80s. So, again, we, we, we took indicators that economists do not even look at and say, oh, my gosh, these things, the long term is very predictable. It, it, you know, economists have it backwards. It, it's the short term that's difficult. This, this recent crash in stocks kind of, kind of, even though we were expecting it sooner or later, kind of came out of nowhere and then all this hidden off balance sheet stuff and all and kind of like Enron. But, you know, the short term stuff, you can get huge curveballs, but long term trends are very predictable. Every 40 years, we've seen generations peak in their spending and you get long term tops in stocks like 1929, 1968, and now, you know, between 2007, 2009. And, and commodities are similar too. It's a different clock and it's, it's more of a technology cycle, but, Commodities have peaked every 29 to 30 years, so 1920, 1951, 1980, and now we think we're due for uh, some sort of uh, peak uh, higher. We don't think the commodity boom's over yet, uh, probably around late 2009, early 2010. So we start with fundamentals, uh, technology cycles, and which go through very clear stages and affect our economy, and we look at demographic cycles of spending, investment, borrowing, all that sort of stuff, and down to micro areas like potato chips if need be, um, and then we look at cycles that repeat, like this commodity cycle and then like the four-year cycle in stocks and the decennial cycle and things like that. And then finally, in the short term on our newsletter, uh, you know, we look at, you know, just like any technical analyst would be, you know, uh, how bullish or bearish are people uh, and that sort of thing, you know, whether the markets are likely to be going up or down short term because the short term really doesn't have as much to do with fundamentals. So we say in the long term, the fundamentals are everything, and they're actually pretty darn easy to measure and project. And in the short term, the technical indicators, you know, how bullish and bearish and crazy people are, uh, makes more difference. I mean, we've got panic hedge fund selling, uh, unwinding all their leverage and bad moves, and that's just causing uh, a short-term meltdown that doesn't have that much to do with the economy. I agree with you. I, I kind of differentiate that by saying there's the virtual economy or the Wall Street or the financial economy, and then there's the real economy, you know, you and I trading, and uh, and there's a difference. Those seem to be distinct elements, and as you see these hedge funds unwind and deleverage, you're seeing a lot of artificial downward pressure on various commodities out there and, and various assets, I believe. One of the things I love about your work since I discovered it in the 90s is how it seems to be pretty simple, at least the way you put it has simplified it so much for me. You know, you name the peak earning years, I think you say are about age 46, or this peak spending years. Do you want to go into that for us? And it seems so easy to follow demographics, you know? It's true. I mean, the, the demographics is simple. I mean, we have a lot of indicators, and putting them together can be complex to some degree. But yeah, the indicators themselves are very simple. Yes, people enter the workforce at age 20 and a half today, on average, you know, part from high school, part from college, and they grow up and earn and spend more money until a plateau between 46 and 50. So all we do is take the birth index, adjusted for immigration, past and future forecast, forecast, you know, move that forward 48 years for the average peak in spending, and boom, the economy grows with that. You've got a 50-year leading indicator. The economy grows with that. The stock market adjusted for inflation generally follows that. I mean, it, it's an incredible indicator. And it allow our indicators, because they're simple, number one, and two, because you can project them well into the future, they allow people to plan for the rest of their lifetime, not just till the next election. I so agree it, with you. It, it, yeah. It's a whole different approach. And again, economists hate people like us because they say that's not possible and the world's too complex and it's changing too fast. But, you know, the more complex the world gets, the smarter we get and the better our information. And all we've done throughout all of human history is is understand more processes and make things predictable, like the seasons and farming and all this stuff. I mean, and now we're saying, gosh, you, you can literally see the major trends in inflation and deflation, spending, you know, investing, different countries around the world, different regions in the country. 
you know, decades in advance. Well, I agree with you, and that's one of the things that's interesting about your work. It seems reasonably predictable to look at macro trends in the United States, but the thing I don't know, you know, I know that in the U.S. we've, of course, got the baby boomers at 76 million person cohort. We've got the Gen Y or millennialists. That's about 80 million of even a bigger cohort, I believe, by a little bit. And so they're entering the workforce now. The baby boomers are starting to think about cashing out and get out of the workforce or at least down grade their spending, start cashing out their retirement plans and so forth. But what are the different cohorts around the world? Because the economies are so coupled and interconnected nowadays. I've never heard you address that thought, and I was wondering what you think about it. Well, we are, we are going to address that. We uh, Much more in, in, in our book that's coming out in late December, January, we have an entire chapter that looks at the spending waves, we call it, the same concept, moving forward the birth index or the age distribution for when people will spend the most money. And it's very different around the world. What we're, we're, we're about to see a very major divide or, 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 or pivot point here where the Western nations like Europe and North America and Australia and New Zealand and, and uh, Japan to a lesser degree that have really driven the world economy so much for decades and centuries are literally starting to age and slow down. The, the millennial generation here is the first generation actually that, that their birth levels only came back up close to the birth levels of the baby boom. In other words, it's not a bigger generation. It doesn't take us to new highs. I, our country is going to more like plateau for many decades. Europe doesn't even have an echo boom generation, which means after 2010, they decline as far as the eye can see. And they've got a big legacy problem because they oh. haven't replaced the younger workers. So now yes, is Exactly. They don't have young people, and without young people, you die. I mean, we, we, we'd say Europe, if you look at demographically, is kind of like a person going into retirement. Europe is retiring. They're the whole country. slow and contract. The United States is more like at its peak, like in its 40s and 50s, still at the crest of its you know, still healthy and strong and, you know, wealthy, but, but not going to grow like it did in the past. And you've got these new Asian economies that are the new 20-somethings and 30-somethings. I mean, China, China surprisingly has strong growth into about 2015 to 20, but then they age. They've got a demographic problem, they too. They have a demographic problem because yeah. they stopped having kids by, by law right. in the early 70s. So, see, in our theory, that hits you about 50 years later, 46 to 50 years later. Um, India... If I, had to, if I had to place my bets on one country going in the future, you know, for in, an investment for my kids, it'd be India. India has demographics, as long as they don't screw it up, to grow into the 2060s, you know, for, you know, five or six decades ahead. Uh, many countries in Southeast Asia grow to 2040s, 50s, 60s, uh, you know, some Middle Eastern countries farther out than that. Most of Latin America grows for many decades. So, we really are going to switch from the developed world to the emerging world after this boom. Um, you know, because people have been saying, oh, it's going to be Asia's decade or Asia's century. But, hey, we've been growing rapidly, too, with this big Internet boom and this giant baby boom generation. But the West really does slow down. And the United States is in a much better position primarily for the thing that most people criticize, our immigration. Our immigration has kept us younger, and the immigrants are having more kids and so we actually do have a, a – it's, it's not a bigger generation, but we have at least a generation to kind of like replace us and at least, at least let us plateau for the coming decades and then have another boom. It's really grim if you look at Russia, East Europe, and Europe going forward, and uh, not too far down the road, China and Japan are the real aging nations. Yeah, I mean, Russia is really a dying nation, even yeah, though they're really. prosperous now, but they, they really have a huge demographic bubble in Russia. On the Europe question, is there a distinction between Eastern and Western Europe as far as the demographic bubble? Because I know the Western Europe is really a retiring region. But what about Eastern? Is that different at all? Now, Eastern Europe booms a little longer, uh, some of them out to 2015 or 20, but then declines sharply. Southern Europe, um, Spain booms and has growing demographics into 2020, and Italy into 2015, and Greece, but then they really drop off. Southern Europe actually is the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and, well, Russia is the worst, and then Southern Europe, and then probably East Europe, and then West Europe, and then Northern Europe is the best. The, the biggest surprise is the people in Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and all that. Very wealthy they, countries. They have very high women workforce participation and very strong support for them, so their, their women still have 
a reasonable amount of children, not enough to replace themselves. I mean, they're going to slowly slow down, but not as much as the rest of Europe. So they're, they're kind of the best positioned. Uh, Great Britain, Denmark, and Scandinavia are the best positioned in Europe. Oh, very interesting. Well, tell us more about the Dent Method, and what do you look at? Tell us uh, these peak spending and peak earning years. I think those are great little simple barometers there. Uh, what are yeah, those? Yeah, the peak, yeah, the peak spending comes between 46 and 50. It's kind of like a double peak, and then people spend less the rest of their life. And then, of course, there's a reason for this whole cycle tends to revolve around kids. We, uh, we enter the workforce around age 20, you know, some people 18, some 22. We get married at age 26, some people earlier, some people later, depending on whether you went to college or not. Then we have kids in our late 20s, early 30s. And then by the time we hit 46 to 50, our kids are either getting out of high school and going to the workforce uh, or they're getting out of college and going to the workforce. So they leave the nest between 46 and 50. And once they leave the nest, not only do you not need a bigger house, uh, and in fact, you bought your house many years before when they were in high school. Uh, but you don't need, uh, you don't buy a car as often because you're not uh, driving them around to soccer practice. You don't need as much food in the refrigerator. You don't have as much car insurance, on and on and on. So people naturally save more for retirement and spend less. Now, saving is a good thing for the individual, but for the economy, you get a whole generation like Japan in the 90s just all of a sudden shift from spending more to saving more and spending less. Well, you get an endless recession, and that's what Japan had. I mean, we did predict that downturn in the late 80s, not only because they had an unbelievable real estate bubble and stock bubble, similar to the United States today, but because they were coming on a, a demographic slowdown two decades before the United States and Europe. So one of the great things when people say, well, what's this going to look like, this slowdown we're predicting? I said, well, first of all, you can look at Japan. They've already been through it. And you know what? Real estate went down 60 to 70% in Tokyo over many years. The stock market went down 80%, even though the rest of the world was booming. So, uh, and, and their government tried to stimulate the economy. They had extremely low interest rates. And you know what? You ended up being more on the deflationary side anyway because the government was pushing on a string. Old people don't need to acquire durable goods, and they don't need to borrow money. They pay down debt. They save, and they don't spend. They particularly don't buy durable goods like cars and houses and things like that. So, that, uh, you know, these demographic cycles are very clear. This, people do stuff at predictable ages. Um, we can tell you when they have the highest mortgage, you know, age 41 to 42, when they invest the most money in stocks and, and overall, and you know, like age 54, when they have the highest net worth, age 64. Uh, you know, anything you want to know, when they buy potato chips, 42, when their kids are <laughs> at the peak of their calorie intake at age 14. You know, I mean, it, wow. it, it, it's a science. That's it's amazing. nothing like economics where people are guessing what the government's going to do and what is the dollars going to go up and down and all this crazy stuff. It's a science that says, look, people, I mean, this is as predictable as life insurance actuaries uh, predicting when you're going to die. Very interesting stuff. What is the peak earning year? What age is that? Is that 46 as well? It's similar, yeah, in the late 40s. Um, earnings actually may peak a little bit later um, or a little bit higher, say more like 50 than, than 46 to 50 as people start to save a little bit. Um, but, yeah, it's a similar time. And then um, earnings goes down as well. People don't just save and spend less, but earnings goes down. One of the first things that happens for a certain percentage of households is women who have been working to get the kids through school and college and support the household say, okay, I've had enough, you know. And women start to leave the workforce quicker than men after age 50. So that's one of the reasons that earnings goes down. And another reason is people probably work less overtime and work less hard and uh, advance less fast. But, I mean, regardless of the reasons, you know, the statistics are clear. People earn and spend more money into age 46 to 50, and they spend, earn and spend less the rest of their life. Very good. So what about the issue of inflation? If you've got a large segment of the population in their mid-40s, is that going to create more inflation because there are more people consuming, more people earning, there's just more wealth in the system? And when were we at that mid-40s, the biggest segment of the population in the mid-40s? Was that in the mid-90s? Okay. No, no, no. We're, we're at that now. That's, we're at that now. When the okay. peak comes, that's the crest of the boom. And, and, you know, it's actually it's counterintuitive, but it's the opposite. All right. Young people are inflationary. Think about this for a minute. I mean, it doesn't get simpler than this. Young people cost everything and produce nothing. Right. I, re I read that, that in one of your papers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. They're inflationary. 
parents have to invest a quarter million dollars to raise the average kid, not counting college. The government has to make major expenditures on the education system and all these services and stuff. And businesses have to build offices for them and equip them with new technology and train them for the first couple of years they come in before they become productive. So when people are reaching their mid to late 40s, they're not only just earning and spending the most, they're the most productive they will be as workers. And high productivity is disinflationary. It brings inflation down. So the reason we had uh, the highest inflation rates in U.S. history, and remember, oil prices were 40 bucks in 1980, and they were $147 earlier this year. And we had inflation of, you know, maybe 4, 5, 6% this year. And back then, it was 14, 15, 16%. And mortgage rates were off the roofs. It's because this massive baby boom generation was entering the workforce. So we have an indicator, like our spending wave, that's called the inflation indicator. And it's a two and a half year lag on workforce growth. When more young people are entering the workforce, that tends to be inflationary. Well, we had the highest amount of that in the late 70s with the highest inflation rate. And then what's going to happen here ahead, and, and this is also kind of counterintuitive, but baby boomers are going to, since there's a larger generation relatively, they're going to start to retire in the next decade faster than the echo boom enters the workforce. And that, when the workforce contracts or slows, that is deflationary. So this indicator, which we, let's see, the spending wave we came up in 1988, 1989, the inflation indicator, this thing tracks inflation better than I would have expected. I mean, even on a short-term basis, it catches most of the wiggles, and it says we're going to have inflation pressures into 2009, early 2010, from the uh, the kind of boom, growing workforce into late 2007 before this slowdown started, and then we're going to switch to deflationary trends from 2010 onwards. Again, uh, we can go two and a half years on this indicator, but we can also go past that and predict, well, we know that people enter on average at age 20 to 21, and we know they exit on average at age 63, so we can project those trends in the future, and it actually projects deflation. Now, that difference is disinflation means a lower rate of inflation. So since the peak of inflation, I think at about 16% in 1980, we went down to very low inflation, say about 1% to 2%, in the late 90s, and now we've come back up to 3, 4, 5, 6% here recently because echo boomers have been entering the workforce a little faster. Then we will eventually go down and see prices fall. Deflation is when prices actually fall. And the only time we've seen that was in the 1930s. The only time in, in any of our lifetimes, and certainly not in my lifetime, uh, it, it was 80 years ago, and we're saying the same thing's going to happen again. It, 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 it appears that the government's going to inflate their way out of this, which they're going to try, and we're going to get inflation, we think, first. But eventually, when the economy slows down and you have to write up all these real estate loans and real estate goes down 50% instead of 20%, the, the contraction of loans in the banking system will destroy way more money because it's so leveraged, 10 to 1, than any stimulus the government can put in, and you end up with deflation in the end. So that's a... That's a mind blower, and it's a contrary forecast. We think we're going to have inflation in the late 2009, early 2010, if we get any type of recovery from this stimulus plan. And then the government's not going to be able to keep stimulating and inflating because inflation becomes the problem. And then the economy finally goes down because baby boomers are on a real downslide in spending, and the government's can't do anything about it, and they've, and they've blown all their ammunition anyway, and we go into a deflationary downturn like the early 30s. So. You can imagine there's a lot of threats there and a lot of opportunity to understand something like that's going to happen. Right. So I agree with you in part, but here's the big part that I'm not sure I agree with you on. We've got this global economy and we've got, you know, two and a half billion people that are playing in the game that just they weren't playing 20 years ago. So what do you say about the consumption from China, India, Latin America? I mean, there's a lot of consumption and that is... It's inflationary, I, I would say, but there's production with it. So when you look at it through the dent glasses, I, I'm not sure what you think about that. But, you know, the, the Fed here has really realized that they just don't have control over the global economy. If it right. were 20, 30 years ago, you know, the Fed would do something and the U.S. would react and it would change things dramatically. And they've used almost all of their ammo. Their last bullet in the gun is a 1% or 100 basis point decline in the Fed rate. And so, you know, they're almost out of bullets. I mean, yeah, they, they, they can't do it because they don't control the rest of the world. Now, they're doing things like coordinating rate cuts and opening more discount windows and, and credit facilities, but it just doesn't seem to be doing the trick. So 
what do you think about the global consumption issue that wasn't well, here? Well, first before? of all, um, global consumption is great for them, but what people don't realize, and this is just a fact, we export only 3% of our GDP to all of Asia. So Asia could be growing at 20% a year, but if we're imploding and, and we're slowing, our economy is still going to slow. And Japan went through the same thing. Japan had a, an endless recession and mild deflation, even with the rest of the world booming on an unprecedented scale across the board in 1990. Everybody was booming in the 1990s except for Japan. So that's one example where a country went through deflation anyway. Uh, and the fact that our economies are coupled, but they're not that coupled. I mean, right. we don't sell that much to Asia. And the second thing is they are these emerging countries in the early stages, and it was true of our country too 100 years ago, are more dependent on commodity prices. It's more part of their equation. India spends 60% of its budget on commodities and foods, and China 40%. We only spend about 10% yeah. of our economy. So these commodity cycles are very important for their inflation rates, and, and we show that commodities are, are due to peak around 2009 or 10 and decline for a decade or so before they come back. So there's a lot of factors, but and when you say commodities, can you parse that up for us? Are there any specific commodities to which you're referring, or you're making a broad stroke there? Well, it's broad. They, they do tend to peak together. In, in, in the last major peaks, like in 1920, major commodity peak, 1980, 1951, these different commodities, agricultural commodities, industrial metals, uh, precious metals, uh, energy, oil, all peaked within about a year of each other. Uh, so they do tend to run in similar cycles and uh right now we, we would be the most bullish uh looking ahead in fact we think a huge buying opportunity is coming here in, in oil and energy if oil hits close to fifty dollars we think oil could go back to its highs or even make a new high 180 dollars in the next year and a half yeah. and and that would outstrip anything any stock market could do and gold will probably at least double gold is a hedge against both inflation and monetary uh, meltdown and and oil is a great hedge against terrorism and that sort of risk. So those are the two commodities. I, I think you know any rebound in the economy will be good for the whole commodity spectrum, but I think it would particularly be strong in energy and precious metals. Okay, so back to the precious metals thing. You know, on the gold issue, I'm a bit of a gold bug, and I generally agree with gold bugs as far as their premise. I just don't agree with their conclusion, and the reason I don't because it all makes so much sense. And you know, gold should be two thousand dollars an ounce right now, in my opinion. But the problem is, it's manipulated by all the central banks that keep selling it off to suppress the price. They trade it amongst each other, and those transactions are recorded, and they suppress the price artificially because they want to pump up their fiat currencies. I can't see any other thing than that. Is There's just a lot of manipulation in the gold market, and all precious metals for that matter. I mean, silver certainly, too. don't know if you study that or what your thoughts are on it, but... I, I don't get in that level, but again, we do look at cycles, and you know, gold did peak in 1980. Um, at $800, near $800 an ounce, and it was projected to go to 5000 and next thing you know, years down the road, it's at 200 something and oil peaked at 40 and it's projected to go to 100 and next thing you know, in 1986, it's $11. So these commodity cycles are among the most volatile, um, and yes, they can be manipulated and everything else, but you know, if I had to put my money in one place here near term, I think stocks are probably going to fall one more time, maybe down to stronger support around 7,000, 7,200 in the next few weeks or few months. But I think ultimately they'll bounce in the next year with this recovery, maybe 20, 30, 40 percent. But I, I would way rather have my money in places like gold and energy right, and oil right now because the bounces there could be doubles or triples. Versus stocks that won't yeah, have that much stocks of a going up, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. I mean, this would be what we call a B wave rally. It's a, it's a bear market rally. It's not, you know, the next, all this stimulus may get lending back to some degree and may help housing stuff. But it, it, like you say, we see what we see, our indicators say, if we get any type of substantial turnaround in the U.S. and global economy, inflation is going to come back faster than hell. And, and you know, inflation is the biggest problem over in emerging countries right now. I mean, China and, and all these countries are running higher inflation rates than we are. And again, they're much more sensitive to commodity prices. So... Uh, inflation is going to wreck this party if the government is even capable of, of offsetting this credit and deleveraging meltdown. Uh, but we're saying, hey, in the end, they won't be able to because baby boomers are just going to get weaker on them. 
and that's going to cause more deflationary downward tendencies. So the government's stimulus plan is not going to work. At best, it ends up in an inflation crisis, which keeps them from stimulating further, and then it switches to deflation. And at worst, it's not enough. That whatever they do and whatever China does is not enough because this credit deleveraging, this credit default swap thing is so huge and, and so toxic that it just – I mean, it, it is literally possible – and for credit to contract yeah. faster than the governments can stimulate. And that, that is certainly what is happening now. <laughs> yeah. That's what has happened yeah. thus far. Yeah. Right, yeah. Now, but this, but this credit's also massive. I mean, I, I mean, that's the biggest argument we have internally in our company right now and with other people. Do we get much of a rebound and bounce, which stokes inflation, or do we just keep melting down? And, you know, we've got people even in our company that think, I, I, and in some other economists I would think, you know, I just don't think they can stop this credit meltdown. I think they can because I'm looking at the LIBOR rates going down. I'm looking at the markets have clearly switched from worrying about a credit, you know, a banking meltdown to worrying about, oh, my gosh, how deep is this recession going to be? They've right. clearly switched, and that's why the LIBOR rates are coming down. Gold has come down. But I tell you, gold gets down much farther and oil gets to $50, we're going to give a very strong buy signal. Because even if we just get a half-hearted bounce, even if oil just went back to 100 bucks a barrel, which would be very easy. Which I agree with, by the way. I, th I think oil is going to be 100 bucks. I think the Dow is going to be at about 6000 is going to be its bottom. And that's where we're going to be. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Now, that near Most bubbles, and it's true of housing as well go back to where they started or a little lower. And, and uh, the bubble really started in stocks in late 94 when the Dow was about 3,800. And house prices, we're saying, will have to go back to 1996 to 2000 levels, kind of when the, where the bubble started there, somewhere in between there. So that we think the Dow is going to probably gonna end up a little lower than that. Um, but it's probably, I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit 7,000 just near term before we get some type of, uh, more concerted bounce. We haven't had a bounce yet that's lasted more than uh, several weeks. Yeah, the election I think, didn't I seem think to we help. may get a three to six month bounce, but I still don't think it's going to be that big. I think this market is mortally wounded. Yeah, it's a bear market. Well, talk to us about, first of all, on housing. I want to ask you to parse that up a little bit, if you would, because people talk about the housing market as though it's some nationwide phenomenon. And in a country as large and diverse as the USA, I mean, there's a market in Texas and there's a market in California yep. that are dramatically different. By it's the way, very different. yeah, it's very different. Uh, you want to parse that up for us a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, it's both true. The markets regionally are extremely different in valuations and supply, demand, and, 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 and uh, you know, space limitation, all that stuff. And, but nationally, there's still like an overall baby boom bubble. And, and uh, the baby boomers were in their peak home buying years, you know, early part of this decade, and then the Fed lowered interest rates to 1%, and the banks started offering all these no money down, low teaser rate loans, and people just went nuts. Um, and we were, we were predicting in 2003, 2004, that was that the housing bubble would peak well ahead of the overall uh, economy, as it did in the roaring 20s. Housing prices peaked in 1925, the economy didn't collapse until 1930, and, and housing as well. Um, because, and that's because demographically housing peaks early in the cycle, and also bubbles can only go so far till they, they blow themselves with their own extremes. I mean, um, Robert Schiller, there's a chart. Actually, on our website, we have some information about our new book. We've got a Q&A that's very useful. It's free to download. We've got a video just above that, and we also have a two-page press release. And in there, it's got three key graphs. It's got this spending wave, this 40-year cycle. It's got this commodity cycle. And it's got a housing chart from Robert Schiller at Yale. He went back and adjusted housing for inflation, size, and quality. And you know what? Housing is basically flat long-term, adjusted for inflation. It basically goes up with inflation or replacement costs. And housing in 2005 and 6 got to basically twice its long-term value, double what it should be. That means, you know, so that means housing has to drop, we're saying, 40 to 60%. And, and, and it, it has done that in some markets. And it might be 80% yeah. yeah. in Miami. The problem is, though, when you look at a market like, I mean, I agree, Miami and California and all the bubble markets have, have another 15% decline ahead of them, in my opinion. But, well, we think um, they got more than that. Oh, even more. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too optimistic. I'm usually not accused of being too optimistic, by the way, but maybe I am. But you look at a market like Dallas where you can buy at virtually the cost of construction. There's no land in the equation. And yep. it seems like you really don't have that much downside risk there, but who knows what. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's why we tell people if you're looking at housing, since you're right, it is so different across the country. Right. 
Uh, this whole thing bubbled up together, and, and hey, while, while housing was going up 3 or 4% in Dallas, it was going up 15% a year in Miami, so there's going to be a huge difference. Look at what your house was worth in 2000, or at worst in 1996, in that time frame. That's a good indicator for where housing will have to go back. And, again, that, that may be a, a 20% correction overall in Dallas and in 70 or 80 in Miami or New York City or San Francisco. So there's huge differences. And you're right. Places like North Carolina and Texas uh, and Utah, I mean, there's a lot of places that aren't overvalued or just barely overvalued, and they'll only probably come down because generally – you know, demand goes down and commodity prices come down and some construction costs, but basically there's a huge difference in exposure, and I'd much rather be have a house in, in Dallas or Raleigh, North Carolina, than Miami or San Francisco right now. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. And especially New York. New York's going to get crucified. Oh, yeah, 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 all the financial stuff. I mean, yeah. they're laying off people on Wall Street like crazy. Tell us about your thoughts. Uh, we talked about inflation a few minutes ago, and I wanted to jump in there and ask you, what do you think about the consumer price index? and the government's official numbers of inflation. Do you think they're accurate? Do you think they're crazy? I think they underestimate true inflation. And you could certainly say that eight, ten months ago. Nowadays, prices have softened up on a lot of things, and they're not so sure. You know, When I used to say that eight, ten months ago, everybody thought, Yash, you're so right. There's no way inflation is only 3 or 4%. It's easily 10 12%. But now people are kind of looking, well, you know, maybe the government's not off by that much. What does Harry Dent think? Well, I, I think the, the, their indicators show the direction. I, I don't think they're that accurate. I, I think on both sides. I think in some cases they underestimate the quality. I mean, you know, they measure a car as a car, and a car is not a car. Cars are way smoother driving, way better stereos, way more safe, right. way more everything than they were. And just like Robert Schiller showed, we have this perception that housing go, goes up so fast over time, but when you adjust it for the size, average size and quality of the features, it hasn't gone up as much as people think. It's gone up with inflation, you know, maybe an average of 3% long term. Uh, and on the other hand, there's a lot of things that are underestimated. And I know, for one thing, for affluent people, inflation's way higher. Uh, there's too many damn rich people in this bubble, and, you know, you got to stand in line for a Maserati, wait two years, and pay a premium and all this stuff. Not so and, much you know, anymore, though. Good wines and <laughs> yeah. high-end homes and vacation homes have right. gone, gone up way faster than other things. So it also depends on who you're looking at. I, there's no question that inflation rates on the affluent or higher, but okay, as long as bonds follow the CPI on a certain kind of basis and, and the direction's right, then we can still predict the direction of inflation. And, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think their numbers are are totally accurate for sure, but I, I think it goes both ways. It, it depends um, who. And I know that Forbes, I believe, was publishing, and I haven't been able to find it. I have looked for it a couple times, a cost of living well index, yeah. the inflation for the rich. And I, I wish I could find that. I've got to, you know, have yeah, I, I, I've got that somewhere. I've pulled that before. I mean, and, and it is much higher. And, right. And anybody who's affluent knows it. There's no question about it. Right. Now, I'll tell you another thing, though, that our research shows from, from way back and, and going over history. The times of the greatest demographic expansion, growth in population, growth in prosperity, have been inflationary. And in other words, inflation is a leading indicator of prosperity. It's an investment in the future. It, it, inflation comes when, when you have to incorporate a new generation in the workforce, when you have to make major new infrastructure investments, and then those investments pay off over time. And the generation, of course, pays off as they earn and spend more money and grow up. And so inflation... Basically, the mass of inflation of the 70s, you just add 30 years to it, and, and you get this boom because people cause inflation when they enter the workforce around age 20, and they have high peak productivity around age 46 to 50. So it's like a 30-year leading indicator. And back historically, it was more like 20. But it's very clear if you look at history, the times of the greatest expansion, whether it be the Greek and Roman empires or, or the uh, 11, 1200s when cities were growing across Europe or the, the 1500s, in 1600s, when there was massive expansion, inflation was rising. So inflation is not the monster people say it is. It actually reflects higher specialization of labor. The more things you contract out to other people and they specialize on, the more services you get, the more you have to pay. But if you specialize yourself, you make a lot more money so you can afford to have all those services and do what you want and do what you do best. And so 
there's a lot of different levels of inflation. There is short-term monetary inflation and commodity inflation, and, and you can create inflation, obviously, from irresponsible government. But long, really long-term inflation, like the inflation we've seen in this century, basically says, you know what, you're in growing times. Demographics are growing, technologies are growing, infrastructures are growing, and you're making investments to keep up with that, and they pay off over time. That is a very interesting outlook. I completely agree when you talk about the specialization of labor. The division of labor issue in a high-tech society is by nature inflationary because you have to pay a profit margin to every provider. Yeah. That, that's a very interesting point. I never thought yeah, of that. And it's before. a luxury to be yeah. able to do that. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. imagine going back to Little House in the Prairie and, you know, you, you know the wife's got to beat the clothes on the rocks all day and you got to sit out there and push the plow and fix the you do it all yourself. Okay. There's no middleman. Yeah. You know, it, there's no nobody to help you, and you got to do everything yourself. Nobody's good at everything. Yeah, very it's good very point. Very inefficient. Well, so when we talk about inflation, if you would address the entitlement issue. See, as I see it, the government has, what, a $56 trillion yeah, entitlement it's, it's, bill coming at ridiculous. it. As I see it, there's only a few ways the government can work its way out of that mess. Number one, break the promises, which they're not going to do because that would be political suicide for both parties. Number two, it would be increased production you know, especially in the form of exports, cut spending, that's not going to happen, increase taxes, there's simply not enough revenue to be gained. The solution I see for the government is just create more fake money, more fiat money. Yeah, but even that doesn't do it either. I mean, you can't, you can't create something for nothing. That, that's never worked long term. It always ends up, if you create fake money, it ends up deflating back out of the system. And but but the disaster. problem with our society is that our whole focus is on the short term. You know, everybody, every CEO... That, that's human nature. Yeah, that, right. That's always been the case. Yeah. But, now, here's the solution. I'll tell you the okay. solution. And it's not your solution. It's not my solution. It's not the government solution. It's the economy solution. All right. Kill the damn system. All right. Pull the rug out after a bubble boom, pull the rug out, have deflation, have banks failing, have companies failing, reconsolidate, go through a big Chapter 11, and then you rearrange all your debts and obligations. And you know what? People will only do it. You're right. Government cannot deal with this because it's politically unacceptable. They can't meet these obligations over time. Even Now, we're talking a not rosy situation for the next 12 to 14 years. Even if we had the economy continue to grow 3 4%, we couldn't fulfill all these obligations with the aging of our society and fewer young people. It's ridiculous. But nobody will face it. Consumers won't admit it. Government won't admit it. you got this one guy, I forget his name, running around, Peterson and his foundation and this other guy, past com control or something, saying oh, yeah, hey, this yeah. is a huge problem, it's much bigger. And they're right. What I'm saying is it'll never be dealt with unless it's forced to. In a crisis, we will end up restructuring this. And the truth is affluent people will get nothing from entitlements, and everyday people will get more ration entitlements, but they'll, they'll, they'll be the ones that'll get them, and they're just going to have to restructure the whole system. It's going to happen between 2013 and 2016 is our prediction. They're, they're going to be dealing with the banking crisis and the collapse of real estate in the 2012 in the second term of Obama or whoever's elected, and it will be a Democrat if it's not him, they'll be dealing with this restructuring of entitlements. So will the entitlements be there? I mean, They'll be restructured. They'll be greatly rationed to the people who really need them. Mm -hmm. this, what's going to happen across this economy, and it happened in the Great Depression too, taxes went up, of course, mainly on the rich and businesses, and entitlements were created, like unemployment and Social Security, for the everyday person more. Um, the affluent are, are going to lose their benefits. If you don't need it, you're not going to get it. And, and the people are going to have to retire a little, you know, they're going to have to be restructured, they're going to have to retire a little later. And that that's, makes sense because we've been aging dramatically in the last, you know, decades. I mean, we shouldn't have retirement set at age 62 or 65. It should be at 70 and, and ultimately at 75 or something. Yeah, I agree. And I think, my, I think a lot of people want to work. There, there's another thing that's important to understand. In the 30s, when we went through the last kind of depression crisis, we were a net creditor to the world. We were more like China, the up-and-coming emerging country versus Europe. Today, we're a net debtor. We don't have the ability to just say, well, we're going to inflate or do whatever we want or restructure benefits or, or create, because China and major countries in the Middle East are holding our dollars and our bonds, and they don't want us to go down. They don't want those things to depreciate more than they have to. But if we're irresponsible, they've got the, the ability to say, well, I'm sorry. We're not buying any more of your bonds. We don't trust you, and, and, and we're dumping the ones we got, and that means you're really in trouble. 
How can you inflate if there's nobody to buy your fake money? Right, I agree, but the question is they're going to kill their own customer. They can't seem to create enough internal demand in their own countries, and you know they will create more as time goes on. Right. But they don't want us to die. That's what yeah, I'm saying. They right. will work with us just and like a creditor. You know, they're already uh, doing chapter it. Chapter 11, yeah. but we can't just do whatever we want. We're going to have to do things that are a little more responsible, and I, I think the best thing to do is invest in infrastructures here and around the world. And, and then that's something that at least whoever's lending you money like China or bailing us out, I think China's going to have to bail us out in the end uh, in the Middle East. And now they've got something they can claim revenues for 30 years if we're building water systems or roads or, you know, alternative energy systems and things. So I don't know exactly how it's going to work out. All I know is to, is to compare it to a Chapter 11 reorganization. I think our entire economy is going to be basically bankrupt. And it's not dead like a Chapter 7 where you just say, okay, it's dead, sell off the assets at fire sale prices and, and give the money, whatever little bit's left to creditors. You just reorganize the debts and agreements, and we're going to have to reorganize our, our debts with China and our internal uh, debts and our entitlement systems, and we're just going to have to go through Chapter 11 and sort it out. And it's going to be a mess, but we'll come out with a much lower cost of living. Right. And business structure and lower cost real estate in the end, which will be a huge boon to the young people just coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be huge winners. It's the baby boomers with all these inflated assets that are going to lose. These young people are going to be able to buy a house for 100000 instead of 200000 and be able to get a 4% mortgage instead of a 7% mortgage. Oh, so your prediction on rates, you think rates will be kept low? Or what do you think about interest rate, mortgage rates? I think they're getting about as low as they're going to get here. They may go a little lower with a weakening economy. And then any sign of recovery, rates are going to hike right back up. I mean, you got a 30-year treasury right now close to 4%, when inflation recently, CPI has been 5 to 6%. Now, obviously, that's only because they expect an extreme slowing in the economy. The economy looks like it's going to rebound, and we're going to be back at inflation rates of 5 to 6%. Well, that treasury bond ought to be at 8 to 9, and that means mortgage rates ought to be 9 to 10 to 11. Uh, so you're going to see interest rates go up if we get a recovery, and up more than people would expect. And then eventually, when we get into the depression stage, which we don't see until at least, say, mid-2010 through 2012, something like that, then rates come down. But they come down on a lag because in the depression, most people don't realize that, that bond yields spiked in 1931 because the crisis looked so ominous. People are thinking, well, gosh, maybe even the government's not going to be able to pay off its bonds. Well, that's certainly going to happen this time around when we're sitting there begging China to bail us out. Because like you say, we've already blown our ammunition on this first phase. We get in the second phase. we got none left. And then you got baby boomers slowing and spending. So it, 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 it's going to be a mess. But ultimately, in, in interest rates go down. The, the 30-year Treasury got down to 2% in the late 30s and early 40s during the Depression. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Your new book coming out is called The Great Depression Ahead. There are still many that are denying that we're in a recession now, which I can't believe. Can you give us a definition for depression? I mean, I know there isn't really an academic one out there, but what is Harry Dent's definition of it? Well, again, for us, it's a, it's a natural part of the business cycle, four seasons, inflation and innovation, a growth boom when new technologies first emerge and create the highest productivity and growth. But then that also creates bubbles and asset uh, inflation that's not sustainable. And then the depression is when it's a shakeout, kind of a Chapter 11, as we describe it, economy that, that takes all that leverage and, and out of the economy and gets prices back down and enforces companies and banks to consolidate for greater scale and efficiency. And it actually ends up creating uh, what we call a maturity boom to follow, like the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where you see more mass prosperity rather than the rich getting richer in this recent boom. So it's a part of the business cycle. It's a shakeout of the system after a bubble boom, and it is accompanied by deflation in prices. That is the key thing. The 70s downturn was inflationary. We had a larger generation entering the workforce, and you know, big commodity bubble and all this sort of stuff. This time, because we have to wash out this leverage and credit uh, and these bubbles, it, it forces deflation for a period of time, and that, that's what distinguishes a depression from a recession. A recession just means, okay, things go down, inflation rates slow down, economy slows, you get some unemployment, but hey, you don't have banks failing all over the place and, and major business consolidation, just minor. A depression is a major change in the economy. It's actually, we have an 80-year new economy cycle in our books, 
and, and the depression hits right at the middle of the cycle. You got an inflation season, a growth boom season, and you switch from rising from an inflationary era to a deflationary era for a time, um, and it's halfway through the cycle. Yeah, okay. So let's talk a little bit about your track record, and I know we've got to close up here. Your track record, when I discovered you in the 90s, read The Great Broom Ahead, I just thought it was fantastic work, and I really got to compliment you. I, I love the work you do. Tell us about your track record. It seems like you've been right on pretty much everything except your predictions on the Dow going to 30,000. Want to address that? Uh, tell us what you think about it. Yeah, yes. We, we have been right about the directions of inflation, the economy, this boom, how long it would last, when it would start to fail. We were right about Japan. We were even right about the deficit disappearing for the government between 98 and 2000. That's probably the most astounding forecast we made. It was just because of a good economy. What we've been most wrong about is the magnitude first of the 2000-2002 correction. I mean, we said, yeah, stocks are overvalued. We're coming for a correction in late 99, early 2000. But we didn't see that big a wipeout in tech stocks at first. It took us a while to catch up on that and see that, oh, that does happen in the, in the, in the tech cycle. You, you mean P.E. ratios can't be infinite? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. We knew it was peaking. Right. We just didn't think they were going right. to drop 70 I know. I we thought it would be like a 30, 40, you know, you know a normal correction. Then, you know, the Dow's down 20 and the tech stocks are down 30, 40. Talk about washing excesses out of the system. I mean, the dot-com bubble, if there was ever an example of excess and stupid business ideas and dumb business models that just never made any economic sense you know you but put it you know, it's you know, funny though it's crazy that's not bad it, well no that's because exactly it's innovation what the economy right? yeah. wants. Mm -hmm. when new technologies come large corporations and governments don't have a clue what's going to be the killer apps and neither do businesses so right. bubbles actually inflate create a lot of capital short term yeah. and let all these crazy people try all this stuff and then you pull the rug out in the depression and then you see who's still standing it really is a very efficient process somebody I think it was John Vogel was on CNBC the other day, and he said, you know, capitalism is kind of like religion. Everybody mm -hmm. talks about it, but nobody really tries it. Right. <laughs> um, capitalism is brutal. The markets are brutal. Well, the thing that concerns me about what's happening now is it seems like the government, they want to just socialize every loss. And, you know, of course, the rich on Wall Street want to privatize every gain, you know. So yeah, know. it's like they won't let capitalism occur. And it, it's it's scary they're because... They're going to regret this. They're, they're, I if it, agree. In the, early, no, the, the correlation we used in the early 90s, it was a short-term crisis, a short-term slowdown in housing. There was a boom to follow. So them, you know, buying up the toxic debt, the SNLs, and then selling off, hey, it worked out. They didn't lose a bunch of money doing that. This is a long-term downturn, and they're going to look like incredible fools that they ran up so much debt early on, bailing out businesses and banks when it's going to end up going down anyway. Um, so I, I agree with you. It would be better to just let this happen, you know, provide some liquidity and stuff, but don't really bail out businesses. If they're going to go under, let them go under. Don't put it on the taxpayers. I, I think they're going to... You're going to have some really unpopular people. I think Ben Bernanke's toast. Oh, I, I do. Yeah, I mean, he I because he's stupid. It's just he's wrong. Wrong, you know, he's wrong time. Helicopter Ben inherited his job at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Greenspan left at the perfect time, I'd say. But I tell you, Obama yeah. is a lucky person because because this crash happened so bad and started to melt down before he got in, he's right. not going to be fully blamed for this. Yeah, right. It's going to look like it was already in process, and he's going to be more like the savior to come in and help the average person. So I. He's, he's in a much better position. Yeah, what do you see um, in an Obama presidency uh, economically? Well, again, I, I don't think politicians, you know, they, it's not that they don't make a difference. They, they're, they're predictable. Mm -hmm. Economy slows, they will stimulate, you know, and the Fed will lower interest rates. And then when things, the economy overheats or inflation rises, they'll tighten. I mean, it's it just, uh, and they always react too late, too little, or, or too much in this case. Um, I, I think it'd be, hey, bonds, if bonds see inflation coming, they'll raise interest rates, short term and long term. If they see a recession coming, they'll lower interest rates. The Fed doesn't have to do this stuff. It's this thing about we need a mommy and daddy to, oh, we got an owie, and we need some, you know, cough medicine, a right. band aid, mommy, you know. It, we're really childish on this. It, it's not just the government's fault. We're, we as people don't want to sit through a common cold and let our body get rid of some stuff. You know, we'd rather take cold medicine and just stop it so we don't have to get stuffed up. Instant you know, gratification. It's a very yeah, popular thing. Instant gratification. <laughs> I mean, that's human nature, yeah. unfortunately. In the end, these processes, these bubbles happen even though people warn against them, and, and these depressions happen even though the governments try to fight them. I mean, Japanese are the perfect example. Zero interest rates, every accommodation for the banking system, and housing still deflated 60 70%, and stocks still went down 80 
and they still couldn't get out of a recessionary economy for you know 14 years. I mean, uh, so you can manage it better or not. But I, you know, I think the best thing is, is a guy like Obama at least has the capacity to provide some leadership. I mean, we were in a time of change in the 60s, and Kennedy was that type of person. FDR in the 30s, and Reagan in the 80s. And you know, Reagan was a real leader, and we were changing direction then from inflation to disinflation, higher productivity, growing innovation. You know, it was a he, he was the right guy at that time. Um, I think Obama's probably more the right guy because basically, uh, we've been saying this for many, many years, the everyday person's going to turn on Wall Street and on entrepreneurs and business people and say, screw you people. You created this bubble, now we're suffering it, you know, we're the ones that need to be protected. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, I didn't let you finish on the Dow 30,000 prediction. You, were, okay. you got to the tech and bubble. The second thing is we look back at the tech bubble that happened before, the bubble boom in the early 1900s, and there was, a, there was two tech bubbles, one from 1914 to 1919, then a big crash, and then a second bigger bubble in, in the roaring 20s. So we were going back and looking at history and saying, oh, my gosh, we're going to have another bubble. And in and, and, and 2006, when oil prices hit $78, we said, uh-oh, uh, no, this, is, this isn't like the Roaring Twenties. We didn't have an oil bubble and rising inflation rates, and, and uh, we, we didn't have 9-11 and a bad, worsening geopolitical environment. So in, in the summer of 2006, I went back and said, okay, here's a divergence. Yes, the stock crash, yes, a slow recovery, but, but by 2006, we should have been zooming into this next bubble. It's going to be a bubble. So... We went back and looked at history, and I came up with two, and I looked very, very hard, (laughs) two important cycles. One was this commodity cycle we've been talking about. Every 29, 30 years, like a clock, commodity cycles peak. And we had, I mean, it's not the same clock as demographics, so it's just a coincidence that we have this commodity cycle coming and peaking at the same time as the demographic cycle. And, of course, rising commodity prices are not good for stocks and stock valuations. And the other thing we found is is a very interesting, somebody had mentioned this once before, and I kind of poo-pooed it, and I went back and really looked at it. There's this cycle, and I don't know why, but we call it the geopolitical cycle. For about every 16, 16, 18 years, things will be very favorable for the stock market, and then 16, 18 years, they'll be unfavorable, just like coming into the, you know, coming after World War II and in the wonderful 50s and early 60s, and then that, 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 uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Kennedy assassination, and Martin Luther King, and then the Vietnam War, and then the Cold War. You know, things just progressively got worse. Well, you know, that same cycle says, you know, in 2001, we, you know, we went from a wonderful time for stocks in 83 to 2000, wonderful for valuations, low interest rates, inflation, peace in the world, and then all of a sudden we get this, you know, 9-11 hits, and ever since, the world hasn't been the same. And, and, and terror, rising terrorism and geopolitical conflicts and Russia and Iran. And, and, you know, stock valuations literally are half. What we found in the cycle, stock valuations are half in the bad part of the cycle than they are in the good cycle. So we cut our forecast from Dow 32,000 to Dow 16,000. And we didn't even quite make that. <laughs> yeah, no, you didn't. <laughs> so, so, so that's how we – our biggest problem has not been the cycles and the direction. We've been – better than we even expected to be at that. Our, we have been off in magnitude. And so these cycles are, are part of what we hope to correct our magnitude problems. Okay, good. Well, I've taken enough of your time, I think. Thank you so much, Harry Dent, for being on our show. It's hsdent.com. A lot of great resources there. Anything you want to mention in closing? Yeah, I think, you know, go there. We've got a lot of good stuff on the new book. You can also, I think, pretty soon sign up to get a copy of the book early, you know, at a discount. And and we've got a a video, you know, that we've just, you know, given to update people on this kind of crisis, this banking meltdown. Excellent. Thanks for talking to us today and your wise advice. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Jason. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. 
Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.